Our lesson tonight is our fourth lesson in strange things you hear about the Church of Christ. And this is one I've heard, uh, I've heard a few times as well, especially when you're talking about mechanical instruments. Uh, people like to say, well, you must not believe in the Old Testament then, or you just don't teach from the Old Testament. And so we'll be looking at the charge this evening, the Church of Christ doesn't believe in the Old Testament. So I want to show the truth concerning the Lord's Church, of course, and the Old Testament. And we want to begin with a simple point. That is, all Scripture is inspired by God. The Bible tells us that very clearly. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, all Scripture, which would mean the Old and the New Testament, is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that a man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now you think about that for a moment, considering what we're talking about this evening. If all Scripture is given by God, and all Scripture is profitable, he says, therefore, doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that tells us the Old Testament also has something for us to learn from it as well. And so we too would continue to teach from it like we often do. He says in verse 17 that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Can you get a good view of the Bible if you remove half of it? Well, no. If you remove the Old Testament, you want to understand a lot of what happening is the New Testament, what's being fulfilled. You'd have verses where for instance, in Acts 2, where Peter says, this is what Joel said. Well, how can you know who Joel is without the Old Testament? And if you had only the Old Testament, not the New, how can we know who the Messiah was, what he did, the apostles? And so we know in order to get the full picture and know what God wants from us, we have to have the complete Word of God. In 2 Peter chapter 1, and verse 3, the Bible says, As his divine power has given to us all things, that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. He has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. We've used this verse many times before. But also let's look at verses 16 through 21 of the same chapter. Here the Bible says, For we did not follow, for we did not follow cunningly devised fables, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. You think about what that is mean, what that, who he's talking about. He's saying we're not following something that someone just cooked up. He's saying we saw these things firsthand. He says we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Verse 17. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Do you remember that? on the Mount of Configuration. You hear, you hear that, you hear, you, they heard the voice of God. Peter being one of the inner three was there. Also at his baptism, they heard similar words as well. Verse 18, And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with them on the holy mountain. That's a reference there to the Mount of Transfiguration. And so we have the prophetic word, notice there, confirmed which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. And we, we talked about this before. What he's talking about there is that the Word of God means the same thing to me as it should, should mean to you. God tells me the same thing that he's telling you. He's told me the same thing that he's told the entire world through his Word. It's of no private interpretation. Verse 21, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so this tells us that all the Word of God is inspired by God, comes from God, and we have from His Word, in His Word, all the things which He wants us to do. His commands, His laws, we learn about His character, His love, His mercy, His wrath, His anger, and also his care as well. So all scriptures given by, by inspiration of God, but part, that is the Old Testament, that you're going to look at, has been fulfilled. 
Let's begin by going to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. And here the Bible says, Do not think, this is Christ speaking, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I do not come to destroy, but to fulfill. You know, sometimes we tell people that we follow the New Testament. They say, well, you're trying to do away with the Old Testament. Well, the Old Testament prophecy has been fulfilled. It served its purpose. We're going to look at it here in a few moments. And that's what Christ is saying here as well. He didn't come to destroy it. He said he came to fulfill it, to carry it out to its, to its entirety. Verse 18, he says, For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law, till all is fulfilled. You notice there, he doesn't say one jot or one tittle will not pass away. He says it will not pass away until it is fulfilled. There is a difference there. Let's also look at Acts chapter 13 and looking at verse 26 through verse 29. Here the Bible says, Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to you the word of this salvation has been sent. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they, find, they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. And when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in the tomb. What, the, what are they talking about? Christ. You'll notice the words we want to focus in on are the words in verse 29, Now when, when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, where was it written? In the old law. The Christ, the Messiah, would have these certain things take place in his life. One of those was that he would die for the sins of all mankind. And we find this here in verse 29, a fulfillment of that. So the Old Testament has been fulfilled. You also could look at the Old Testament has been blotted out. In Colossians 2, looking at verse 11 and following, the Bible says, In him you were all circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith, in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. And then having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a, or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ." He's talking about how all these old law requirements have been blotted out. He says they were taken out of the way and Christ was nailed to the cross. He says in verse 17, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So the Old Testament has been fulfilled. It has been blotted out. It also has been taken away in Hebrews 10, verses 1 through 10. For the law having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. What he's talking about is that when they came to offer sacrifices, they just what? He says year after year, they could not be made. He says there in verse 1, he says, could not, uh, he says, which they offer year by year, make those who approach perfect. He says they can never with these same sacrifices make a person perfect. Verse 2 for, for then they would not have ceased to be offered for then would they not have been ceased, ceased to, to be offered. For the worshippers once purified would have, would have had no more consciousness of sin. So he's saying if they took away sins they wouldn't keep coming back to offer up sacrifices for them. You remember they had the, something to do at the end of every year on behalf of their sins. They, they would place things on a goat, they called the scapegoat, he would carry off their sins, and that was symbolic of taking away their sins. Verse 3, But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year, that's what I was just talking about, 
For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, who is the he? Christ. When he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for, for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings, and offerings for sin you do not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law, the Old Testament law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. What do you think he's talking about? He's talking about the law. You know, I've had a person say, Well, there's not a old, there's not a New Testament law. There's just more added to the old. Well, how many times do we have to find verses such as this that show that clearly the old law was done away with? He says in verse 9, He takes away the first, which would be the old law, that he may establish the second, which is what we call today the New Testament law. By that will we have been sanctified through offering the body of Jesus Christ once for all. On the old law, they had to offer up sacrifices and do so all the time. Even the priests had to offer sacrifices, and then they had to have a remembrance of all their sins once a year. When Christ came, the Bible says in verse 10, He says, By that, we, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once, He says, for all. So the Old Testament has been fulfilled, has been blotted out, He has been taken away. It has been done away with, as we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9 through 11. It says, For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. I'll give you a little hint. The ministry of condemnation is the old law. The ministry of, he says, of righteousness is the new law. Exceeds much more in glory. For even when what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. He said the old law was good, but what's coming now, he says, is better. He says, or what remains is much more glorious, that is, the new law. So the old law has been done away with. And lastly, the old, the old law has, been, has fulfilled its purpose. You know, I think sometimes that's where people get confused, is they don't realize that a law serves a purpose. It's kind of like when you have a new tax is put out, you know, half a cent tax for a certain purpose. And when it has a certain time period, and when that time period is up, it's fulfilled its purpose. And they have to decide if they want to keep it, a certain type of movement or something has to be done, or it's going to be done away with. Well, it happens more than not. We know, of course, they make their motion or whatever, and it kind of just sticks around forever. But we see here... We're going to see the Old Testament law has fulfilled its purpose. It had a purpose and it fulfills, has fulfilled that purpose. Galatians chapter 3 verse 17 through verse 24 says, And this I say that the law which was 430 years later cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before God, or confirmed by, before, by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions. Do you catch that? The old law was added because of sin. When you have a problem, you have to do something to correct it. Sin was their problem. What did God do to deal with it? He had the old law. Or what for them, the law. He says, it was added because of transgressions till the seed. Notice the word there, seed, is capitalized. He's talking about Christ. Should come to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator does not mediate for one, for one only, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? He says, certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly, truly righteousness would have been by the law. Do you catch what he's saying? He's saying if the old law could have done what Christ was, was going to do, there would be no need for the new law. Verse 22, But the Scripture has, con has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which, was, which would afterward be revealed. So he's saying we were kept under the old law until the law of faith, the New Testament law, was revealed, was put into place. 
Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, you could say, justified by faith, and not by following a, the old law. Look also at Galatians uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. It says, Stand fast, therefore, in liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will, not profit, will profit you nothing. If you remember the setting here, they were telling these people you had to be circumcised, which was an old law command, in order to be saved. They are binding something that was no longer in effect, weren't they? And he says in verse 2, he says, Indeed, I, Paul, so he's specifying that it's me talking. It's not by inspiration. He says, Say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing, saying if you believe that circumcision is essential for salvation, he says, then Christ is going to profit you nothing. Christ is what saves people is what he's trying to tell them, not circumcision. He says, and I, I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he's a debtor to keep the whole law. He's saying you're going to keep part of it, you've got to keep all of it. And we find a lot of people today doing the same thing. They like to take some things from, that was allowed and tolerated in the old law and add them today. Verse 4, you have become estranged from Christ. You attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from, from grace. They're saying if you keep the old law and don't follow the law of faith, that is follow Christ and have faith in Him, he says you're fallen from grace. You're unfaithful. It sounds like to me we better not... We're going to try to follow the old law and keep it in order to have salvation because Paul says that's not going to work. Verse 5 says, For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. What is he talking about? The old law ways are not going to grant you eternal life. But following Christ, he says, but, but faith Working through love, that is, a faith in Christ, will grant you eternal life. And of course, we know and understand an obedient faith. So we've seen five things for us to think about concerning the Old Testament. It has been fulfilled. It has been blotted out. It has been taken away. Uh, it has been done away. It has been done away with. It has fulfilled its purpose. Well, let's examine some objections to that, or some objections to uh, to really to the church itself. Some will say, if the Old Testament is not in force, you are limiting God. Think about that for a moment. That's a pretty strong accusation. If, if your, the Old Testament is not in force, you're limiting God. You know, think about this for a moment. They're saying that if you do not believe the Old Testament, which of course we know we do, don't we? We teach a lot from it. There was some literature books, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Job, those types of things. Those are some of my most favorite books in the entire Bible. But you think about this, the accusation, if the Old Testament is not in force, you are limiting God. And of course, we believe the Old Testament law is not in force. We think about this, for instance, we are not limiting God. In fact, he has said all we need for justification and daily living is a New Testament. Look at 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. What did God tell Paul to, to say? What did Paul tell Timothy? He says, all your scriptures come by inspiration of God. He tells us what's profitable for. But also notice uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. That God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. Now you think about this, the knowledge of Him. Who is the Him we need to have knowledge of? Now we just good to know about Moses and Abraham, but who's going to save us? Christ. We need to have a knowledge of Christ. While there's a lot of things we can learn from the Old Testament, we'll get to that in a moment, we better understand the New Testament. Because we can quote Scripture from the Old Testament all day long. You're not going to get to heaven by knowing only the Old Testament. We have to follow God and follow the new law which we are under and follow and be obedient to Christ and believe in Him as the Son of God. So we are not limiting God. Of course, we say that the Old Testament is not enforced. The Old Law is not enforced, but doesn't mean we cannot learn anything from it. Some would say, if the Old Testament is not enforced, then the commandment, then the Ten Commandments are not enforced. 
Well, we don't follow the Ten Commandments per se in the New Testament, but what's interesting, as we'll see in a moment, you'll find them in the New Testament. You'll find every one of them except for one. But also we find there in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, where Christ begins his Sermon on the Mount. You also find, as you go through that sermon, that he talks about, you have heard it said of old, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not commit murder, all these different things. And what Christ begins to say, you'll find the phrase, but I say unto you. And what you find is that Christ takes the Ten Commandments and he raises the bar. He says, not just adultery anymore. He's saying now it's, if you look after a woman to lust after her, what does Christ do? We were here and he takes us here. And so the old, the Ten Commandments are there, but Christ brings us, you might say, to an even higher plane of morality. Notice who the, who the Ten Commandments were for, who that was written to. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Who did God bring out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage? The Israelites. It's for those people. We are at the very, you might say, the very crust, the very beginning of time for those who are following God. He was giving out commands and laws, you might say, all day long. But who is it directed towards? Those living on the old law. Also notice Nehemiah 9 and verse 14, which says, You made known to them your holy Sabbath, and command them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses, your servant. You made known to them... Who's he talking about? The Israelites. And really all those who'd come to follow God. He says, you may know to them uh, your uh, precepts, statutes, and laws, your holy Sabbath, by the hand of Moses, your servant. Who was the old law written to? Well, it's very clear, very easy to answer. It's written to those who lived under the old law. Because when Christ came, his, his goal was to uh, bring and tell people about the new law that would come into effect after his death. So we had to think about to whom it was given. But also look at Romans chapter 7, verses 4 through 7. And we'll get there in a moment. But look here, you'll notice, you'll find, this is an example of the old law, the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament, and then you can find them in like manner in the New Testament. That's the first five. And I don't expect everybody to see that. That's the first five. But you can find, you notice, every one of them except for number four, remember the Sabbath. Because what day of the week do we worship on now? The first day of the week. My point isn't we follow the Ten Commandments. My point is that they're repeated in the New Testament, meaning they're part of what? The new law. We don't refer to them as, new, as the Ten Commandments anymore. It's part of the law. Here's number 6 through 10. You can find those as well. Number 3 is, if the Old Testament is not in force, the Old Testament has no value. I mean, I've never personally heard that before, but that's a pretty, another pretty strong statement. If the Old Testament is not in force, then what's the point of it? Why do we need it today? Look at Romans 15 and verse 4. It says, Whatever things written before, that's a reference to the old law times, were written for what? He says, For our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. It should bring us, and them during that time as well, comfort to see what was written concerning, especially concerning Christ and the Old Testament, all those prophecies and all the prophecies about the church coming and then seeing it come into fulfillment. He says in verse 4, he says, that, he says that we through the, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. We can see those things being fulfilled. For us today, we can go back and we can look at the old law and see all those prophecies concerning Christ. Not just how he would come to the earth and how he would die, but also all the things he would do while he was here. And we can find all those things fulfilled in the New Testament. And those things should bring us comfort and hope as well. Look at 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 11. It says, Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the, the ends of the ages have come. He says, We have these people as examples. What kind of examples do we see? You want to run from God and see what happens? You go look at Jonah. You want to see what happens when God, when Satan says, I can strike your strongest servant? Go look at Job. You want to see what happens when you sin 
and you allow sin to just encompass and overcome cities. Look at Sodom and Gomorrah. Look at the world when it laughs and mocks God and the majority is against you. Go look at Noah. Go look in Genesis and Adam and Eve when you give in to peer pressure and you do something which is commanded, commanded by God not to do. And look what happened to Eve. Look what happens when you keep your faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel as well in the fiery furnace. And on and on it goes. Those men who walked around, those people who marched around the city of Jericho, the walls of Jericho, follow the commands of God. The Bible tells us when they obeyed and did all that God had told them to do, the walls of the city fell. Time and time again we find examples of what to do and what not to do. We find examples for us to follow. As we close this evening, this accusation about the Lord's church is simply not valid. How could someone be even a Christian, let alone the church of the Lord, and say that we do not believe in the Old Testament? Because we learn so much from it. We may not be under the old law, but we can still learn much from those who live under the old law. It also is easy to see how this indicates the problem faces many in the denomination world as they have, you might say, poor understanding about the old and new law. Also, let us determine to be diligent in handling the Word of God properly so that we may be able to be teachers of those who are walking in darkness. And we'll close with 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, which says, Be diligent and present yourself approved to God. A worker does not need to be ashamed, rather than dividing the word of truth. You know, years ago, before I ever became a member of the Lord's Church, you would talk to me about the Church of Christ and tell me, well, they don't believe in the Old Law. They don't believe in the Old Testament. I probably would have took it, you know, hook, line, and sinker. But we have to realize, if you want to know what people truly believe, especially any religious group, we need to actually make a, a sincere investigation of it. And that's always our plea to those who come into our building and come in contact with us. We talk with them. We'll be glad to answer those questions. To those who will listen to us online as well, we welcome them to come and visit with us. When you go on our website, for instance, and it's very much what I call a teaching website because there's just so much stuff on there. It's almost ridiculous that you can spend, you wouldn't have to go anywhere else. You find a plea about what, we're, what the Church of Christ is about. You find sermons, you find sermon outlines, you find Bible classes, you find gospel meetings, all those things have a purpose to teach the truth and the others know what we are about. And you remove any of these strange ideas that people hear. You know, I think back now when people still say those types of things, and I'd say, you know, I hear some strange things about you. Can you explain if this is true? And ask them, for instance, various different things. One of the things I ask about many times is, how do you place membership in your congregation? And it's really very simple. Because you'll notice in the Bible, we don't place membership in the congregation. We place membership in one church. That's the Lord's church. So as we hear these strange things being said about us, let's make sure that we do all we can to correct it and to clarify and to remove any misconceptions about the Lord's church because we want people to know the truth. And the truth isn't confusing. The truth is one that will bring people to Christ and hopefully into eternal life. This evening, as you think about these things, if you have any need or concern, you come forward now. That's going to be Stan Singh to encourage you.